This podcast is sponsored by Inside Out Group, the specialists in high risk and challenging filming and time lapse, covering health and safety videos for rail, construction, and infrastructure projects nationwide. Welcome to this week's Safer Than Your Average. On the show this week, we have Carolyn. Carolyn, if you just want to come in and introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about your background. Sure. Uh, my name is Carolyn Pierpont. I currently residing over in the Netherlands in Rotterdam. Uh, I'm working for a, a dredging and marine company called Buscalis. Um, I work for the Subsea Services Division, which is diving and ROV operations, predominantly IRM work that we do, and I'm the CQ Manager for Subsea Services. Excellent, excellent. Thanks, Karen. So if we move on a little bit, just to talk a little bit about your, your early life, where you grew up, a little bit about your background. Mm -hmm. Sure. So uh, I'm actually uh, a daughter of a, an American naval officer. Uh, born in the east coast of the, the United States. Um, I actually, uh, and, and I hope this doesn't offend many people, but uh, I'm actually classified as an accidental American because um, I only lived there for a couple of years and then uh, we moved back to the, the UK. Um, my parents divorced, so. Um, but I was brought up in a, a small town northeast of Scotland called Wick in Caithness. Yeah. Lived there for 21 years, and at that point, uh, I went to school, wasn't interested in high school at all. Um, you know, my guidance teacher told me, Carolyn, the best you're going to be is a hairdresser. Now, in, back in the 1990s, being a hairdresser was perms and blue rinses. Um, now it's complete art. Um, so yeah. even if I became a hairdresser now, I'd be quite happy. But back then, um, I didn't really fancy myself as uh, doing perms and blue rinses. So, uh, you know, my mom had said to me, Carolyn, you know, you can't just leave school and do nothing. So you need to do something with your life. It's fine. So I went down to Inverness and I studied uh, HND in sports coaching with development because I decided I wanted to be a development officer for sports for children really mm -hmm. was something I was interested in because I, I'm a, an ex-dancer as well. Um, and I moved back home after I got my HND and I applied for a job as the sports development officer. And I was told, well, I'm sorry, but you don't have enough experience um, to become a sports development officer for Kate Ness. And I said, OK, well, how do I get experience? Well, you need to get experience within the sports industry within Kate Ness. OK, so I applied for a job as a lifeguard at the local swimming pool and I got told I was overqualified to be a lifeguard. So I was like, well, what do I do? So I applied for a job at BT Internet and got a job as a computer analyst um, fixing modems when it was the screechy noise that you'd listen to and dial up networks. Um, yeah, uh, back in the early, uh, the mid 90s. Mm. And so I did that for a good couple of years and uh, <laughs> Typical female, I got bored um, of the boyfriend that I had and decided that I was going to move down to Aberdeen because I had family that actually lived there, my aunt and my uncle. And my uncle was actually in the oil and gas industry, but I didn't quite know, in fact, still to this day, I still don't really know what he did. But I knew that he was uh, big in oil compared to being a young whip girl uh, going to Aberdeen. So I actually split up with the boyfriend and um, moved down to Aberdeen and I got a job in the local um, telecoms company called Atlantic Telecom and mm -hmm. an older cousin of mine worked, uh, he didn't work, sorry, he uh, drank in a pub called Number 10 in Aberdeen. I'm sure some people who visited Aberdeen have, have drank there and I worked there for several years, but five or six years, but it was a hub for oil and gas people to go down and drink, especially on a Friday night after work. And I got yeah. in tow with um, some people there. And I was like, oh, Carolyn, this is how you get a job uh, within oil and gas. And you have to go to Bryant Engineering or recruitment agencies. Of course, a young girl from WIC, what's a recruitment agency? I was completely clueless. It was like big city for me, although now it's, uh, it's actually quite mm -hmm. a small village. So I applied for um, a recruitment company. I got a job then at Shell. And I was actually a secretary. I was the PA to um, one of the IT managers. 
I loved it. It was great. And he, he taught me so much. And he would go off to, um, uh, I'm probably going to say this wrong, Reich, Reichweich, um, with Shell. And he'd be in The Hague as well. So he mm -hmm. was hardly there. So I'd do a lot of work when he was there. And then when he was gone, it was like, oh, loose end. Now, where I was in, uh, in the Shell building, I was next to a small group of guys that worked for an organization called Step Change and Safety, um, yeah. which is a huge organization now within the oil and gas industry. And again, that was back in the early 2000s. And it's just when Step yeah. Change and Safety had just kicked off. And mm -hmm. their secretary um, was about to go off on maternity leave. And I'd been talking to Alan Thompson. He was one of the original guys that worked for Step Change and Safety. And he's like, oh, he, he was, he was Faye Bucky. And he's like, you must apply for the job. Amanda's going off, apply for the job. I was like, oh, yeah. okay, no worries. So I did. So I applied for the job at Step Change and Safety. And at that point, we were all sponsored by companies. Um, so I was then sponsored by Talisman, well, the then Talisman mm -hmm. back in the day. And I think it's Cinepec Grepsal, it's called now. Yeah. Um, and from there, that's, that's kind of the, the early part of my the, the, the start of things from leaving WIC to getting a taste of, of the oil and gas industry and, and then the, the birth of my HSE career. Yeah, yeah. So can you tell us a little bit about your first role with Step Change in Safety then and what you were involved in and the development that you've done there? Yeah, to be honest with you, I was really pretty much admin support for, for the, mm -hmm. the guys. Um, for Neil Burton, he was working for Shell at the time, and Alan, he was working um, for Britannia Offshore. Um, mm -hmm. And um, I'm going to forget his name, and if he's ever going to watch this, he's going to get, he's really going to give me a row for it. <laughs> <laughs> um, it, but we had some, a representative from BP and we also had uh, Transocean um, mm -hmm. and I think at the time um, Tom Botts, he was the managing director, um, was a sponsor for uh, Step Change and Safety but then Alison Golightly from Slumbergy then mm -hmm. took over. So because of that we had to come out of the Shell building to go to mm -hmm. Slumbergy. And again, I would just set up the leadership meetings between all the managing directors of oil companies, subcontractors, marine contractors. Um, <clears throat> I would do the printing, I would get their teas and coffees, and it was just um, the administration work. Mm -hmm. I loved it. It was, it was good because I was interacting with people. I was phoning members, um, trying to get membership. So we then left the Shell building and had to move to the Slumbergy building out at West yeah. Hill. Um, and I remember um, back in early 2000s, the winters in Aberdeen were really yeah. bad. Um, and I mean, they're still bad now, but we had a leadership team that was in the Talisman building. Mm -hmm. And I remember because I lived in the city centre, because I was still young then and still partying, I wanted to stay in the city centre and everybody else all had families and lived out in the Shire. Mm -hmm. um, so we had this leadership team meeting. We started at eight o'clock. So I was there at half past seven, sitting in reception and nobody was there. So I got taken up to the boardroom, set everything up, put the paperwork out. I had all the presentations as well. And then um, Neil phoned and he says, Carolyn, I'm, I'm stuck. I says, well, uh, what do you mean you're stuck? He says, I can't uh, start, start the meeting. So Alan's gonna have to do it. I said, yeah, Alan's and Bucky, there's no way he's gonna manage to get into Aberdeen if you can't make it in from cults. So Alan then phoned, he couldn't make it. And then the rest of the team, they, they phoned and they couldn't make it neither. So it was just me, all these managing directors from all these oil companies. And I'm like, oh girl, you need to do something and you need to do something now because you know they're not gonna sit and wait. These guys are busy, busy guys. So I put mm -hmm. the presentation in and I was so nervous. I can remember my throat was quivering and it was, uh, it was just off. It was awful, but I kid you not. It was like taking a child, and, should I say this and throw them in a swimming pool? It's, um, but the, the anecdote yeah. I mean is that, you know, it was either sink or swim. So um, yeah. I, I think I, I, I kind of waded a little bit, <laughs> a little bit of doggy paddle. I kept my head above the water and it was fine. But anyway, interestingly, at the end of that meeting, the managing director of Technique, Ian Stevenson, 
had mm -hmm. approached me and he says, oh, you know, you did really, really well. And we could use somebody like you within, within the company. Um, and we've yeah. got actually somebody that's about to leave on maternity leave and you would slot in perfectly in that role. And it's like, mm, I don't know, it's an HSC coordinator's job. So it's an up from an admin job. And he's like, no, honestly, mm -hmm. great people's person. We need somebody. I said, okay, I'll think about it. So he gave me his card and that was it. Um, so we were in the building and I sent him an email saying, look, I'm I think I am really interested in this role. So he then um, handed my CV over to the HSC department and Alan Hanna was the um, HSC manager at the time and Nick Fitzpatrick. So I was invited in for an interview and I went in and I can remember uh, sitting in Alan's office and again, I hope he's not watching, but he, he sat there and he said, right, Carolyn, we need all these graphs done because we've got these amount of vessels and I need to know how many LTIs we have and how many MTIs and, and first aid cases and man hours. And I'm sitting there going, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, I know how to do it. Yeah, no problem at all. I'm like, oh, gee, and Google hadn't been invented by then. So I really had to, to understand how to do an Excel sheet. <laughs> so I was like, yeah, yeah, no worries. I can do that. No problem. So uh, he says, right, okay, you've got the job. So, and that was it. So that was my, my first proper HSE job was HSE coordinator for, for Technique. For, I think Technique FMC, uh, not FMC, sorry, Technique Coflexive at the time. Um, and yeah, it sounds bad that I blagged my way through it, but you know, I, I knew that I could do the job and I was determined to do it. You know, I'd come this far, I'd left home and uh, I thought, no, I'm, I'm going to do this. So that was my, my first role. Excellent, excellent. So how did your career progress from there then? Mm. Gosh, have you got enough time? Oh, definitely. <laughs> so from there, um, yeah, so from there, it, um, I got this job and I soon realized what exactly what it was. So Sharon um, went off on maternity leave and I took over her role um, until she, she'd come back. And she was actually looking after a IT system called Synergy, which mm -hmm. I think most companies use now. Yeah. Um, and it, it basically allows you to analyze all your safety data. So I had a look at it and because it was all mandrolic, it, it was difficult to get um, the man hours in and people would send them in late and we'd never know how many incidents we had or hazards. We couldn't do any trending. So it was quite difficult. So we got this, um, Technip had this system. So I had a look at it and um, started manipulating data and saying, right, well, this is not fit for purpose, having a look at the way that the business model was set up, etc. And then from there, um, we set worked with NDARG at the time. Um, there were two, two women that we worked with and um, a gentleman, Bill Wibley and Elaine Rust. So we worked with them. And from there, they helped us develop the, the system for the, the vessels and we got the vessel to input the data, but the bandwidth on the vessels wasn't great, but we were still getting the, the, the data. And it was, it was really a difficult, um, time but we managed to get it and it was basically a click of the button and it was like I don't need to do these spreadsheets anymore <laughs> because the system does it for me <laughs> it was great but um what had happened then was the group HSC director then in Technique Paris um Peter Watton he he had heard about what we'd done in Aberdeen and he says oh, well we need this globally so we need we need somebody to coordinate it globally mm -hmm. And he approached me then a couple of years afterwards and he said, would you, you know, come to Paris and, and, and set this up for, for the whole company? Mm -hmm. I was like, uh, yeah, no worries, of course. <laughs> so um, at that time, then I started studying my knee Bosch yeah. because I needed to understand health and safety and, and, and understand the law and legislation behind it and, and, and understand HSE pretty mm -hmm. much. Um, but I was getting a bit of twofold because I was studying and I was also getting hands-on experience yeah. on um, HSC full stop. Mm -hmm. Now, there's no Q in there because I was predominantly just HSC and that's mm -hmm. it. Um, so anyway, I was invited to Paris, got the job, but I was still based in Aberdeen, but I'd go over to Paris maybe every three, four weeks. But then um, we'd have to, we developed the business model for how this was going to work, how we were going to apply it 
globally around technique. I mean, not just the vessels, but even the ethylene setting plants um, over in Rome, for example. We had to get buy-in from everybody. Everybody had to understand it. And then we had to have a look within the, the, um, the countries to see who could be like a synergy administrator and then who would be the contact feed into me and then how would feed all the information. So there was a lot of work behind it. And then in amongst all that, so I think I did that for yeah, about approximately five years, um, or maybe a bit longer, actually, six years. Um, and then I fell pregnant um, mm -hmm. and I was ready to, to move on. But in, in amongst that as well, there was a shift change of management um, between mm -hmm. Peter and the next person that came in was actually Ian Stevenson, who was my original first managing director at Technique in Aberdeen. Mm -hmm. He then became the corporate group CQ director. So I'd gone from yeah. working for from Ian to working for Peter back to working with Ian again. So it, and it was really good, actually. Um, mm -hmm. You know, between all the managing directors that I've worked for and, and, and HSC directors, I've always been um, coached by them and mentored by them, which is yeah. pr pretty much been the, the pivotal of my career and decision making of where I see myself and where, where I am and who the person I am now. Um, the so, difference between a manager and a leader, isn't it, as well, that they're able to give you that coaching and development rather than just instructing yeah. you to do? Yeah, yeah. Um, it, it was quite funny the the differences from then to where i am now because i can even remember um the old days and again i hope i don't offend anyone but it's just reality and it's what happened but i remember going into my manager's uh, office and i used to have to knock on the door and he used to sit there and type and he'd be typing 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 of course me being me i'd be you hi alan i'm at the door hi and he'd just peer up between his glasses and then he'd peer back down and keep typing and i'm like Oh, how rude. Okay, so I'd, I would stand and, and wait until I finish, and then he'd beckon me in. <laughs> I would go in and I'd sit down. Still not quite understanding what was going on, but it wasn't until a couple of years after that I realised that um, we don't all work the same um, as I do. Uh, I'm such a bubbly, outgoing, chatty person that not everybody is like that. And being 23, 24 years old, I couldn't understand why this man in front of me, who was in his 50s, wasn't as bubbly as what I was. But unbeknown to me, he just liked finishing his work before somebody barges into his office and starts going, hi, um, I've got your paperwork. So yeah. as I grew um, as an individual and grew with the work that I was doing, I had different mentors as well going through the stages yeah. of, of my career. And it is, there is a huge difference um, between the mentor and, and, and the leader or the manager. Complete difference. Yeah, yeah. Excellent, excellent. Okay, so where did you progress to from there then? So um, I had the baby and mm -hmm. obviously I couldn't do much traveling. So I finished up uh, in Paris and actually the, the system itself had then been rolled out globally and you know it was fine mm -hmm. it was all working so at that time um i had been asked well we're going to put you back to the uk and um, what we think we'd like to progress you in is project hsc advising and i was like oh okay that's fine um mm -hmm. i got my knee bosh uh, by then and i actually got my british citizenship by then as well so it was like a double whammy mm -hmm. for me um mm -hmm. and uh, from there, I worked on multiple projects for, for Technique, different types of projects. Um, I had quite a few incidents to investigate, um, one particular, two particular ones that stick out in my head, but I won't go into detail about it. Um, sure. But two particularly did because um, one, both of them were very similar. Because um, I, th I think one of the, the questions that we were, or one of the topics we were going to discuss was um, about pivotal areas of, of my, my career. And two of these mm -hmm. really stand out. And, um, and it was all complacency, all old school guys just not understanding why they decided to put themselves on a line of fire. Um, you know, I was, I was watching the CCTV camera of one, one incident we had where a chain block fell on a guy's head and 
you can see in the camera, he's sitting there puffing away in a cigarette in the back. <laughs> like, why? He's like, mm, don't know. And it's these unexplainable incidents that happen that they just don't know. Yep. So um, from there, I was approached by a drilling contractor. Actually, it was a recruitment agency for a drilling contractor. Mm -hmm. um, again, working in Aberdeen, it was a Norwegian drilling uh, company. And um, yeah, I, I went for the interview and I got the job as a CQ advisor for a drilling company. Because mm -hmm. I'd been in subsea work for, I think by that time, just under 10 years. And I kind of thought to myself, well, that's nice for the CV. And, you know, I was very loyal to Technique mm -hmm. as well. And it was, that, it was the company that, that I grew up with, so to speak. It was, you know, my, my go-to company and I loved it. And I still have many, many friends that um, still work for Technique. And I thought, no, that's going to round off my CV quite nicely to get into the drilling industry and find out what, what happens within drilling, what they do, what the differences are in safety. So I moved over to, to Dolphin Drilling. Mm -hmm. um, and there was myself and one, two, three, four other advisors um, and they had a quite a big team actually, and it was so diverse. I mean, Jillian's completely yeah. different from Subsea. It really, <laughs> the, um, yeah, it's, it's, uh, I can only explain it as a much more of a harsher industry yeah. than the Subsea uh, industry. It's, um, it, it, it's tough going. It really is tough mm -hmm. going. Um, and I remember my first trip offshore it was to a hotel. I, they, they'd given me um, my own hotel as the CQ advisor. So, so that was my little first project of the Borg Home Dolphin. And there was 300 men on this platform <laughs> with this hotel and, and me. And, and that was it. And unfortunately, at that time, they couldn't get me into the Dolphin Drilling um, accommodation. So I had, to, I had to sleep in the accommodation where the other guys were saying, um, mm -hmm. which was fine, but it was, um, I think one of the questions you've asked is about challenging and that, that was challenging to yeah. be able to have the confidence to walk from my office to my room and you had hundreds of these guys and uh, yeah, you know, they're, ooh, Carolyn, hi, yeah, hi, hello. <laughs> <laughs> and then into my room and, and that'd be it, door locked and that would be me for 10 hours until next day shift but but no it, it, it was fine it wasn't over intimidating but the first time you go offshore it was it was pretty intimidating so so yeah I went to, to Dolphin Drilling but unfortunately um well before I get to that point um Dolphin were building a new um drill rig mm -hmm. down in South Korea in Nielsen and it was actually, they asked, they assigned me to it, the Bolster Dolphin, it was going to be called. And it was for, um, I don't know if I'm allowed to, yeah, I am allowed to say, Chevron um, Rosebank project, that was the West of Shetland. So we were building mm -hmm. this this uh, drill rig for them. So I would go down to Ulsa maybe every three weeks or every six weeks. It would just depend on baby and, and husband and flicking back and forth mm -hmm. and what he was doing. And... Um, yeah, loved it. And then one day we got told that that was it. Doors are shut, empty your desks, go home. Because um, contract got pulled, uh, the oil and gas, uh, the gas market hit rock bottom. Um, mm -hmm. the, the project got canned and that was it. And there was layoffs. And unfortunately, I was one of those um, uh, people that were laid off from from Dolphin. I was gutted because I lo I loved working for the company. I just I've actually not had a bad experience working for any of the companies that I've worked for. Um, yeah, so that was it. So I was then um, unemployed in November. It was coming up to Christmas. Um, my husband and I were supposed to be going on a honeymoon uh, to Vancouver in the January then. Mm -hmm. Uh, so it was about 2015 because we just got married in the, the July and then I was paid off in November. So mm -hmm. uh, devastated. So we um, went off on holiday. I had a couple of months off. Um, went off, sorry, on our honeymoon. And during our honeymoon, I got a Facebook message from an old technique colleague of mine 
saying, Carolyn, mm -hmm. there is an HSC sub C advisor role going for CNR. It's got your mm -hmm. name written all over it. And I was like, oh, okay. So I'm, I'm in Vancouver um, on honeymoon going, well, how the hell am I going to apply for this? So he says, I don't know, just figure it out yourself. So no laptop, um, couldn't really do much on the mobile phone, didn't have my CV. So I asked the hotel, if you've got a laptop I can borrow? They said, yeah, it's no worries, okay. So went into my Yahoo mail that I've not used since I was maybe 24. Um, Cause I, at that time I didn't have, a, you don't go on honeymoon with a hard drive unless, oh, well, maybe some people do, but I don't. <laughs> So um, I checked my Yahoo mail, searched CV, and up came an old CV from, I don't know, back in 2000, and then it would have been maybe 2012. So I sat on my honeymoon for about three nights, updating my CV from 2012 up until, say, 2015, or 2016 it was at the time. Um, and then I Googled HSE manager CNR, and Rob Engel's name came up. So... I checked Facebook to find out who this Rob Engels was, and there he was. I'm like, oh, okay, oh, one friend in common. Who is this? Happened to be an old PT, personal trainer of mine, um, in the Village Hotel in Aberdeen. So popped him a little <laughs> message. How do you know Rob Engels? He says, he came back, says, oh, I'm best friends with Sam Lewis. I went, can you find out if there's a job at CNR and if I can apply for it? And Ollie said to me, yeah, Caroline, you're on, you're on your honeymoon. I don't care. Just ask, please. So he did. And he came back and he said, OK, this is very weird. He says, you can apply for it, but it's not it's not going to externally. Um, and I think they might have got somebody, but you can go and send your CV. Mm -hmm. OK, so I sent it to, to Rob and some one of the girls, um, Rebecca, came back from HR and she says, oh, we like to invite you to an interview would you be able to attend mm -hmm. I says well currently on honeymoon at the moment I'll be back in about 10 days so she says well if you could come in on the Tuesday that would be great and I said well I only get back from um, Cancun because we went from Vancouver to Cancun so I get back maybe on the um, like the Wednesday but if you can get me to the Thursday to go over my jet lag I'd love to she says yeah no worries she says well in the meantime when you come for your interview, you need to do a presentation and uh, we'll, we'll send you what you, you need to present on. I'm like, oh, it just keeps giving. Okay, no worries. So they sent me, um, uh, what did they send me? They sent me a, a, a question on uh, how I would, um, cost effective, uh, how, how to be more cost effective for the environment. I'm like, oh. So I studied, uh, or studied, I looked at their website, I looked at CNR's website, had to look at their core values, had to look at what, what, what they, they perceive as um, cost effective for environment. And, and I, you know what, I didn't hit the brief, but they liked what I, I did. So, um, so anyway, I did the, the presentation on the honeymoon and uh, we got home from, from Mexico then, went for the interview, I was super nervous. There was Rob and then, Peter Ronnie and went through the presentation. They asked me a few questions and that was it. And the following day I got the job at CNR. <laughs> I have a very similar story actually. I was in Cancun in 2014 <laughs> um, on my honeymoon and I was studying. Okay, do the, can we just make this clear to your readers that it's not our honeymoon? <laughs> 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 and I was studying. I was a year I was later. studying for my degree programme. Um, so much to my, my wife's enjoyment, the whole time that I was there, I was studying analytical measuring for my health and safety degree. <laughs> and I went back and absolutely <laughs> aced the exam for it. I think it was the highest scoring exam that I'd done in the whole degree programme. So I must have been doing something. Maybe it's the way forward. <laughs> just to, I'm divorced now, so maybe in my next honeymoon, if I find another husband, I can do something else, study something else. So. <laughs> yeah, so that, was, uh, that yeah. was my honeymoon as well. Fantastic. Didn't think we'd be going there in this podcast, but there you go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly yeah so I mean that was it I mean my honeymoon was literally taken over by PowerPoint presentations in fact when we were in Vancouver that's when I did my CV but when we went down to Cancun 
um, that's when I did the presentation. So, uh, yeah, it was it was good. But no, I got the job, and you know, I worked for CNR for for two years, and uh, oh, it was again, it was it was difficult because they're an operator, you yeah. know, and they they obviously have a subsea um, arm to them as well yeah. because you know I, the way I describe it is with operators, yeah, they've got their top side, but it's like a car, you know, you lift it up and you've got all the pipework underneath yeah. it that still needs to be maintained and fixed as well as the top side. So, so yeah, so they had they they had a, I had a great team. Um, Richard Barrett was my my dive manager, and uh, we, we had a really really good time, really good time. Mm-hmm. And, um, and the HSC team as well for CNR, it was it was great. It's like another family again. Mm-hmm. And I actually thought that, you know, CNR would be my, my next technique. Mm-hmm. I'd be there for a long time. Um, however, then the opportunity to to move to Holland uh, presented itself. And I mean, that's 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 another story. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so my, my career is uh, yeah, full of these kind of stories. But yeah, so I um, a friend of mine worked for Pascalis at the time and she was saying to me, you should get your husband to, to apply for a job because we really need more engineers in the UK because Pascalis were just starting to, to break into the market then uh, within the UK. Although they had worked a few contracts, but there was no steady contracts within uh, for Pascalis in, mm-hmm. in the UK. So anyway, um, my husband then, he, he got a job with uh, Pascalis and he said, look, if, when we move over, my wife's going to need to work as well because I'm not one for not working and they said oh what does she do and he said oh she's actually um hse advisor for specifying really in sub c and they went oh our shq advisor for sub c services has just left so and we're interviewing right now for um somebody with sub c experience so they said would you send her cv in so they did and um, my now boss, uh, Bart Rulaf, uh, had flown over from Holland and interviewed me then. And um, he says, oh, we'll be in touch. And I says, all right, OK, that's good. So I never heard anything. Hi, um, just wondering if there's any update on the job. And I've been told, well, there's some things that are changing. We're not too sure what's going to happen with the job, but can you just bear with us? And I was like, yeah, sure, no problem. Mm-hmm. But as it turned out, I actually fell pregnant again for the second time. So I was like, oh, mm-hmm. no, gosh, OK, this is not, not going to happen. So anyway, I got a phone call to say, oh, you know, we're really pleased um, to, to give you the job. And I was like, oh, OK, that's, that's wonderful. And of course, I hadn't handed in my resignation to CNR yet. And I thought, well, OK, pregnant, so maybe I should phone them and, and tell them that I can't take the job. So they called me then a couple of weeks later and they said, oh, you know, we're sorry, Carolyn, but unfortunately the, the job's not there. Um, we need to withdraw, you know, thanks very much and we'll keep you in consideration. And I was like, okay, no worries. I thought, oh, well that works because I'm pregnant anyway. So um, I can just stay where I am and that's it. However, a week later, I actually lost the baby. So um, I, I, yeah, well, it's, it's, it's life. But um, I actually had an ectopic pregnancy, so I was actually rushed into hospital and uh, they, they had to remove, remove the baby. So um, the following day, my mobile went. So I'm lying in the hospital bed and uh, I'd, I'd said to my husband at the time, I said, so can you go and get me slippers, please? Um, because I don't have any. So the slippers he took for me, I've actually got them on, happened to be these yeah. ones, which were like Dutch clogs. <laughs> so, <laughs> I'm lying in my hospital bed with my Dutch clogs on, and this is Daniela from Pascalis. Oh, hi, Carolyn. Mm-hmm. Uh, can you speak just now? And I'm like, uh, yeah, hold on. I'm just in my office. I'll move to a meeting room. Uh, grabbed my IV drip, and I toddled through to one of the other rooms in the hospital and shut the door because I didn't want to tell her, oh, by the way. Um, I was like, yeah, yeah, that's, um, I, I can talk now. She said, so um, we would like to re-offer you the job at Pascalis. And I was like, oh, that's handy. Okay, yes, no problem. I'll, I, I'll think about it and I'll get back to you. So uh, I thought about it for, like, I knew I was going to take the job, but I thought I'll just phone them back the next day. So I did. And I said, oh, I'd be delighted to take the job. So um, she says, before you take it, we'd like you to come over to Holland and uh, have an interview. And I was like, oh, yeah, sure, no problem. With 11 people, not one, 11, 11 people I had to meet. <laughs> so, 
<laughs> anyway, so I was discharged from hospital and uh, flew over to Holland maybe a couple of weeks later. And, and the 11 people were actually colleagues that were part of that, that management team at the time. So in between uh, all that happening, then, uh, yeah, that was it. We were ready to move to Holland and I got the job. So, but uh, yeah, <laughs> that was it. Mm -hmm. So you moved over to Holland and started working there. Um, how did you find the transition yeah. moving to there? Was it a lot different from working uh, in the UK? Yeah, well, the job, um, so I was offered the job as Shiki manager, mm -hmm. and I'd never been a manager before. And I was like, oh, no. Um, but it actually, to be honest with you, without um, blowing my own trumpet, I, back, I, I took to it quite naturally um, because I, I feel that I'm quite a natural uh, coach and a natural mentor. Mm -hmm. Um, and I know this might sound terrible, but I'm a mum, so it's quite easy to nurture yeah. people, to be honest with you. Um, and it, it did really come quite natural. It was it was a bit of a culture shock, to be honest with you. The amount of um, speeding fines that I got in Holland was unbelievable because I didn't quite understand how the road network <laughs> worked, uh, driving on the, well, it's the right side, but the wrong side for me of the road. Um, but no, the, with regards to work-wise, um, it was slightly different for me, um, I, you know, my the guy that works for me, uh, Luke, him and I would um, come to great debates with regards to what a risk assessment should look like and what it should look like. And I'd been trying to tell him, look, but the UK market, this is how we would present it. And, um, you know, it was it was just different. It wasn't what I was used to looking at when I worked for other subsidy companies mm -hmm. um, and not that it was any less it was just different but what was really nice was that I started working with more of a diverse um, culture of people with South Africans and, and Dutch that I'd never worked before mm -hmm. but it was good because they're to the point they're direct and you know where you stand with them you know and, and I like that I like knowing where I stand with somebody mm -hmm. rather than trying to read somebody and think Oh, if I upset him or her, mm -hmm. or if I said something wrong, they'll just tell you. Yeah, you know that's they'll 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 tell you where their boundaries are, and I really really appreciate that, and I really like the way of of working that way. Yeah. Um. Yeah. So there there was there there is a difference. There is a cultural difference, but it's just how you adapt it. Yeah. Excellent. Excellent. So how did you find living in Holland then? Were you getting used to the kind of way of life and? getting around whereabouts in Holland are you based as well? So I, I currently live in Rotterdam and we work mm -hmm. out of uh, Papendrecht so Buscalis is over 100 years old and it was okay. based in Sleedrecht um, which is now Papendrecht so it's actually just across the, the little river it's not not too far um, so I'm about mm -hmm. 20 kilometers away from from the office but uh, I mean, I've, I've not really been in the office for, I th I'm coming up on 11 months, but I'm sure we'll touch on that in a minute. Um, yeah. But yeah, it's, it's, not, it's not too far. It's, um, to be honest with you, where we are, um, and I can only compare my experience with Aberdeen and the Shire and, and Wick as well. Um, cycling here and outdoor life is completely different than what it is um, in the UK. I mean, I used to try to cycle from... Uh, West Hill to CNR offices, and I'm, I'd take my life in my hands <laughs> because mm. you, the, the cycle pass would last up until Kings Wells, and then after that, it's like free for all <laughs> cars, yeah. uh, buses, cyclists. So, but here, you know, the, the cycle, the cycling has got its own network. You could cycle the whole mm. country um, and be on a cycle path and be nowhere near a road, and they've got their own traffic mm. lights for cycling, and it's, it's great. It's definitely the way of life. So I think the highlight of moving here was actually getting my Dutch bike with the baskets. Loved it. And going mm -hmm. to the markets, it's, um, yeah, it's, <laughs> it's, it's completely different. But you are dynamically risk assessing every time you jump on your bike, you know, or even every time mm -hmm. you get into the car because you come to a junction and you go, okay, left, right, or actually right, left, pedestrians, and then left, right, cyclists, and then cars. So you've got like a, a process that you, you get into this um, rhythm of doing every time you jump in the car. So, mm -hmm. but yeah, it's, yeah. It, it's, def it's different. You know, I've 
been here for for two years now and uh, yeah it's uh, I, I really do like it really do enjoy it and I've been working between in fact actually six months after I left Aberdeen they opened an office in the Aberdeen in, uh, in Aberdeen so, <laughs> so I was like oh okay but it's fine because you know I think what COVID has showed us that we can work remotely anywhere um, and still do, anywhere, yeah. still do a job yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. so it was um, it was good, and then of course, I, you know, I, I signed up for this job um, to work for Subsea Services within Pascalis, working for one person, and then next I hear we've got a new managing director um, who's come in, and things were starting to change, and the management teams were changing, and there was more people from the UK coming in, and I'm like, okay, I left here, I thought I was working for, you know, the Dutch company, and now I've all of a sudden got a new office in Aberdeen, so I'd been, I'd spent most of my time, like, once a week in Aberdeen, and then flying back home to Holland again, and <laughs> it just mm -hmm. felt really strange, but it was good, it, it was good, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, if we move on a little bit to talk about some of the challenges that you've had across your career, because obviously you've moved up, health and safety manager, big company, moved international, went to Holland, and then had some health trouble as well. Do you want to cover that off yeah. a little bit? Yeah, so um, you know, it's funny because the, the one of the questions you've got is about the challenges that I've faced in, mm -hmm. in my career. And I think right now, any anybody would say that COVID would be their challenge at the moment. And I kind of don't want to go down that route because there were other challenges that I do want to touch on actually, um, that might be a little bit controversial, but it's just, it, they're my personal challenges. Yeah. But um, going back to your actual the question, um, it was January, end of January mm -hmm. uh, last year in 2019 that um, I had to go over to the Dubai office. So I went over and um, I remember one of my CQ advisors was saying, oh, you know, about this COVID. And I was like, yeah, yeah, I've, yeah, I've heard about it it's in China and it's making its way over. I says, but what about it? He says, oh, I've done a, a presentation on it and we're a way to start purchasing PPE for the vessel. I was like, oh, okay. Um, do we think it's going to be a problem? Well, it might be because it's starting to, get traction okay so um he started doing this presentation and i thought this is uh this is really growing arms and legs now this, this, i think this is going to become quite quite mm -hmm. big so he was doing this presentation about you know cover your cover your face and cough in your arm and wash your hands and um, wear masks where need be, hand sanitize, and we're also having a bit of an argument with the building, the, the owners of the building to say, look, you need to make sure that you're putting hand sanitizers outside so people can sanitize their hands coming in. Now, this is in January. So I, I remember phoning um, my boss at the time. I says, look, you know, this is what we're doing here in Dubai. I think we need to maybe start thinking about getting ready just in case, because when it comes to diving, um, if any of our divers get ill in the bin, then or in the chamber, sorry, I mean, they all get mm -hmm. ill. One gets the flu, they all get the flu because of the environment that they're in. Mm -hmm. So anyway, that was, that was the end of January. Between January and then um, the beginning of February, in fact, if I rewind back in December, I do a lot of running, um, or I did a lot of running, um, just to keep fit in because I, I really enjoy it and I started um, feeling something in my sports bra and uh, it was it was bothering me but I just stick it to the back of my head because I've been really busy and um, I knew that I was going away to Dubai Christmas and New Year was coming up um, and then had this trip and then I had another trip in Aberdeen coming up and I had also a girls weekend planned in London so there's all this going on um, my husband and I just separated um, to, to divorce um, in the October, so we had that as well. So by February time, um, this area of my, my breast was getting even more sore. Mm -hmm. So I remember dropping off my son, uh, picking him up actually at school, which I don't normally do because I'm just too busy to do it. Um, I'd spoken to some of the mums on the playground and they said, how are you? And I was like, oh, I'm okay, but 
I've, I've actually I found a lump on my left breast and it's sore and I always thought that my mum told me that if you ever find a lump in your breast and it's sore it should be okay because she had she was diagnosed with breast cancer when she was 51 and mm. her sister was 52 when she was diagnosed with breast cancer so they said oh, Carolyn, go and get it checked out and I was like yeah yeah, yeah whatever I, I really haven't got time because I'm, I have to prepare for another um, business trip to, to the UK. This COVID is starting to kick off. I really need to get my head around what's going on. And um, and that was it. So I left the playground and I just looked at my son and I thought, I'll phone the doctor. So I phoned the GP and I says, can I uh, make an appointment to get this lump checked out? And she says, well, we've actually got an, um, a slot in half an hour. And I was like, oh, perfect. So we went in and my son just sat and played on his phone and she checked it out and she says, oh, it's a, a, like a marble. And I says, yeah, it is. She says, mm. she says, I'm not too worried about it, but why don't you come back in a week's time? And if it's still there, then we'll send you for a mammogram. She says, all right, okay. Now I'm 42. I thought, there's no way I could have breast cancer. No way, because I'm too young for that. So I went off to the UK and we... That I mean, COVID had just kicked off then. That was the middle of March, and mm -hmm. it just come into Europe then. And I remember speaking to my my managing director's um, PA, and I said to her, "I was like, this is just crazy. What's going on?" She says, "I know." Mm -hmm. So I remember phoning um, the health and safety executive and, and asking them if you got any guidance for us. Is there anything that we can use? Um, with regards to what checks we need to put in place and we put risk assessments in place, it's fine. But is there anything else? Because we've no idea what's happening. And uh, they says, no, you know, we, we're we doing the same as you calling around. And I remember calling uh, IMCA and asking them as well, do you have any any guidance for the sub subcontractors? No, they don't have anything. I'm like, okay. So we then, you know, I pulled my team together and says, right, let's get some management plans in place. In the event somebody gets it, what do we do? Let's start having a look at what plans we put in place. Let's have a look at offshore. We got the Korean department involved. We got our diving manager involved, um, our operations director involved. So we all came together and, and we put this management plan in place. Um, and then, as it later turned out, the IMCA just, they used it as a blueprint. And um, because at mm -hmm. that time, that was all that was kind of there. And I remember phoning, um, the HSC manager at Reaver, who was across the road from us. And I, I just said, mm -hmm. have, you, have you got anything in place? He's like, no. So, because at that time I felt it's not time to be competitors. It's time now for everybody to come together and, yeah. and, and do something and, and, and work together as, as one, because it's not gonna mm -hmm. affect just us, it's gonna affect everybody. And then our clients started asking us questions. What have you got in place? And thankfully we had stuff in place. Um, mm -hmm. We had actually at that time managed to get PCR tests as well. I think we were one of the first companies, subsea companies, to get them because we had projects that were ongoing and they needed we needed to get yeah. off because we had contracts to fulfill. So I knew that I was going down to London as well that weekend, and um, I had the um, doctors on the Monday. So. So that was on the Friday. So I'd, I'd left and I'd said to my boss, you know, remember I've got the doctors on Monday. So yeah, yeah, good luck for that. So thanks. And um, so I went down, had a girly weekend in London. It was great. And arrived in Schiphol Airport on Sunday. And that's when they closed everything. Um, I think I recorded it on my phone. I think it was like by order of the government, all catering facilities um, are now closed until further notice. I thought, oh, this is... This is really serious. So anyway, on the Monday, I had the um, doctor's appointment and I, they, their doors were locked because everything was closed. So I'm standing ringing the doorbell and the woman said to me, have you been anywhere uh, for the past week? I'm like, uh, London. I says, but I feel fine. And every, I, you know, I, but I really need to get this. I need to get checked. This is because I've, I've got this lump. And she says, all right, come in. So I went in and I saw my GP and I says, it's still there. She says, right, we'll send you for a mammogram. Mm -hmm. That was fine. So I went for a mammogram. Whew. Um, and it's not any woman watching this um, or any man who's had a wife or even any man that's gone through a mammogram before. It's it's quite hard because it's like this machine that just compresses and it makes your breast like a pancake. But then they stick a needle in it just to add insult to injury. <laughs> 
And what they're trying to do is trying to find this mass to take some cells out to test it, to see if there's anything untoward. Um, so they did see something on the scanner. So they stuck a needle in and they said, oh, we need to put you around for an ultrasound and then we'll take you back around again. And I said, well, what is it bad? And they're like, well, we don't know and we can't, we can't comment. And their English wasn't very good neither. Mm -hmm. So I uh, went back around, got another mammogram, got another blinking needle in my, my, my breast. So that was the first. And then I got called back two days later to say that that came back negative, but we found another mass somewhere else in your breast. So can you come back so we can take some more samples? Mm. I was petrified, you know, because at that point then everything was closed down because of COVID. Mm. I couldn't take anyone with me. Um, a single mum, um, I had to phone my ex-husband and say, can you take the wee man because I need to go back into hospital. So um, cause schools had shut as well. Mm -hmm. So off I went back into hospital, got the um, uh, next biopsy done. And then on the Wednesday, the following week, I got called in to the oncology department for the results. Mm -hmm. And of course, I was just expecting them to say, oh, uh, Mrs. Toshney, it's, um, it's fine. It's just fatty tissue and off you go. And I'd, I'd Googled um, lumps and just what everybody else does, goes to Google doctor and uh, I'd convinced myself it was calcifications and that's all that they'd seen. And uh, yeah, I went in and he, he said to me, uh, are you by yourself? And I was like, yeah. He says, uh, do you want to call anyone to have on the phone? Said, no, it's fine. And then somebody else came in I thought oh this is uh, this is pretty serious then and uh, he just said uh, Mrs Toshney I'm afraid it's bad in fact it's it's really bad and I went well, what do you mean it's really bad he says you have breast cancer mm -hmm. uh, I just oh, I thought I was gonna puke all over the floor mm -hmm. I said, are you sure yes sure and then he just took a piece of paper, started writing, uh, like they put this horizontal line um, and then put a vertical line and halved it. And he, he put one, two, three, and then one, two, three. He says, left side is not cancerous uh, or pre-cancer cells, right side is cancer cells. And you're right in the middle, but we think you're over on the breast cancer side as well. But until we remove your breast, we won't know. I'm like, whoa. So all this information. And he says, do you want me to stop? I says, no, just keep talking. And he said, we need to get you an MRI because we've only tested the left breast. We couldn't really see anything on the right breast, but we'll take you back in for an MRI. I said, well, when can I get the MRI? So they, you need to find out where you are in your, your, your lady cycle um, for the most effective MRI. So as it turned out, it was smack bang in the middle. So they says, right, we'll take you in tomorrow. We'll get your MRI done and we'll check the right breast. And I says, no worries. So I went in for the MRI then on the Thursday and I had to go into the full MRI machine, um, feet in first, head down, arms up. Um, they kind of squash you in and I had to be in there for half an hour and I'm claustrophobic. So it wasn't really the best situation for me to be in. However, I can tell you for half an hour, you can sing the Scottish national anthem six times. And you can also sing my son's Peel Banana song five times. I kept the MRI lady entertained for half an hour. <laughs> so and I came out the MRI machine. I thought, oh, geez, I don't really want to do that again. Um, but as it turned out, they, they did find something on the right breast, but they weren't too sure. So uh, they took me in for the next interview. And I actually took one of my Dutch friends with me. She was a, a colleague as well, because she knew how I felt, my feelings, my emotions and stuff. And uh, we sat there and, and she says, right, we're going to take the left breast off. Um, I says, well, you can just, so at that time she says, but the right breast, we're going to have to put you back into the MRI machine. I went, uh-huh. She says, and we're going to have to put um, a needle into you again for another biopsy. I'm like, uh-huh. She says, we'll do that for about an hour, an hour and a half. Of course, Charlotte, my friend turned around and went, what's plan B? Give us a plan B. We can't go with plan A. It's definitely got to find a plan B. So I says, listen, plan B is take the right breast off. You can take them both off. I don't need them. They don't serve any purpose for me. I've had a child. I've breastfed. I don't need my breasts. They don't define me as an individual. So take them both off. 
So she says, well, it's not up to me. It's up to your surgeon and the oncologist and they need to decide. So she says, so if you're going to have the left breast off, um, you could go for reconstruction again. So we'll introduce you to your plastic surgeon. So off I went through for two hours from a plastic surgeon to talk about breasts and, and nipples and, and, and stretching the skin and temporary implants. I just, just this whole new, whole new world that I've never been exposed to. But um, it wasn't until I was out running two days later with my son, he phoned me and he says, look, he says, I'm, I'm not too sure about the right breast. He says, I do want you for an MRI. I says, listen, I'm telling you now, you're taking them both off. There's no negotiation here. You're taking both my breasts off and that's it. My mother had breast cancer. Man, he had breast cancer. I'm not going to go the rest of my life worried that I'm going to go through the same on my right side. So you can just take them both off. He says, right. He says, listen, I need to send you for a psych test first to make sure that you're not making an irrational decision. Mm -hmm. And only then I would say we'll take the right side off. So I did, I spoke to a psychologist and straight away she's like, I can tell that this is not a rational mm -hmm. decision. I said, I've already made my mind up. If you're gonna take both, take, take one, take both off. So um, on the, then after that, they said, well, we need to see how far the cancer is um, if it's spread through your lymph glands. So I had to go for one, for one operation first to check the lymph glands to see if, if it spread. Um, and those test results came back negative. So the cancer hadn't spread. It was just contained in the breast. And then on the 29th of April this year, I had both my breasts removed. Mm. Um, and it was horrendous. <laughs> really, it was just horrendous. But um, I was bouncing back within five, six weeks. Um, I had my drains out. But then um, they had installed temporary implants. And the best way I can describe them is that it's like water balloons underneath your chest. Mm -hmm. So they now use your, my pectoral muscles to become uh, new breasts. But in order for, to get the shape in that, they have to stretch the skin. So I've been going through that process for 10 months. But within that 10 months, I've endured four other operations because of failure of my skin infections I've been in and out of the hospital consistently for that time mm -hmm. so um but I remember coming out of the hospital and I phoned um I phoned my mom obviously and uh, then my ex-husband and then I actually phoned my my boss my managing director and I explained to him and he was amazing he he was like Carolyn just as of today that's it you're off go and concentrate on yourself and we'll support you 100 percent um, I spoke to my functional uh, CQ manager and also the Buscalis CQ director and the HR director, and they have looked after me for 11 months mm. consistently. Um, it's I've had so much support by, from Buscalis, I can't can't thank them enough, and colleagues as well. Mm. It's uh, been in a foreign country as well. It's been hard with the language barrier at times, but I've had colleagues that have stepped up to the mark and have come with me to hospital and. I've been there and food parcels and looking after my son and yeah it's uh, they've they flew my mother over to help look after me as well because i've had no family here mm -hmm. so it's yeah been remarkable so much for sharing that story carolyn you're one of the most resilient people i've ever met and you've still got Thanks. you're an amazing personality in the background i can't believe you're on an mri singing, singing the national anthem and the, the banana song <laughs> You know, that's, that's, I don't even know what to say to you, and I'm not often lost for words on the podcast, yeah. but wow, thank you so much for doing yeah. that, and hopefully it helps anybody out there but, that's potentially got, yeah. got the same issue. Thing is, is, uh, you know, I get quite a lot, I get people say, oh, you're such an inspiration, you're so strong, and and, and it's really flattering, and I'm really touched with the, the support that I've had throughout everything but I've had no choice but to be strong I've, I've really had no choice and um, when you're faced with something like this you can go two ways and and I and I can see that um and you know what I haven't mentioned during this this call is that just before my son was born my husband at the time was diagnosed with a brain tumor mm. so we've already gone through this in our lives you know he, he and he's bounced back thankfully you know and he's he's here to see his son and stuff but but when you're faced with something like this and anybody watching this who's who's been touched or a family member or 
partner, whatever a child has been touched by cancer, you, you, you have no choice. You, you just have to, to be strong. But I've, I've actually started, um, I've seen a life coach as well and because I, I, I really want to discover who, who I was and who, what my personality was. And, you know, and, and I'm glad that I did that because it allowed me um, to grow to the person I am today. And what it allows me to do as a manager now um, with my guys, even pre-breast cancer, is I feel to be that mentor for them and um, to guide them in their careers and where they want to go to. Because I think that was one of the questions you asked, you know, where do you see my career going? And I do see yeah. very much me still being a CQ manager. You know, I have... I, I'm happy with what I have you know I, I don't feel that I want more I, I've got my life and I'm happy to be alive I'm, I'm happy to be there for my son um, and I'm happy to, to, to earn money and you know I'm grateful and thankful for all this so I have no further drive to, to do anything else but inspire people mentor people and be a really good manager because I've been managed by people before um, I only say maybe one one or two people that I thought, I'm never going to be like you. I'm never going to be like mm. you. I'm never going to yell. Um, yeah, and I'm always going to have fun. And I'm going to be a team member. Yes, I'm a, a manager, but I'm also a team member. You know, And I've always said to my guys that I'm not going to sit here and pretend that I'm any better than you guys or know any more than you guys. You guys are specialized in, in different areas than what I'm specialized in. But what I'm good at is being a good manager. And that's that's what I want to thrive thrive to be, you know, and, and get the best out of them. So that's mm -hmm. that's where I see myself. You know, I don't see myself being anywhere else, you know, unless, yeah, I win the lottery and I can buy my own island. And, yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Excellent. I actually saw a really funny job advert. Someone shared it on LinkedIn the other day. Um, the ideal job. And it was working for Richard oh. Branson on Necker Island as the health and safety manager for Necker Island. <laughs> so I think that, well, that would be a cool job. Yeah, yeah. Well, do you it's know, I, I, I remember when uh, I was working for Dolphin Gillian, Gillian at the time, um, and then I knew that I was getting paid off. We were, me and my colleagues were all looking through um, what jobs there were. And Brewdog were looking for an HSC director. And I was like, yes, I'm going to go for that one. So I applied for it. And one of the questions was, um, if you were a superhero, what kind of superhero would you be? And I remember, just, I can't remember exactly what I put, but I remember just taking the complete utter P-I-S-S. -S. And, uh, you know, I, I, we all thought, this is brilliant. I'm like, yeah, job's definitely mine if I get it. They're like, yeah. So I pressed send and within two seconds, boom. Thank you. Uh, it was Miss Pierpont at the time. Thank you, Miss Pierpont, for your application. But unfortunately, you have not been successful. I'm like, huh. I thought it was a really good description of a superhero, though I can't remember what it was, but I knew it was really good at the time. But uh, then I later figured out I was just a computer. I didn't have a keyword. That's that's all it was. <laughs> yeah. That would have been a dream job. So if anyone from BrewDog is seeing this now, I should have been your agency manager. <laughs> excellent. Excellent. So continuing on from there, Karen, I know you mentioned that you had another couple of big challenges. Is there any other ones that you want to bring out health and safety wise in your career? Yeah, no, I know it sounds uh, a bit dubious, but do you know what, what really has been my biggest challenge, but they've been few and far between, is being that kind of old style, old school methodology on, um, on mindsets. Mm -hmm and changing mindsets and understanding that um, you know being in a subcontracting world uh, and I've been on the client side and I'm now on the, the subcontracting side um, or I've been on the operator side not the client side but the operator side so I've seen both of it and I think um, I find it very difficult when you know I've got a team of uh, really competent people that know what they're doing, understand the law. We are rigorously audited by different companies, different um, governing bodies and, and so on and so on. And then there's one or two people or individuals that feel that because they, they don't see something that um, they've maybe been used to seeing before, um, that they feel that you know a company needs to change or people need to change what something looks like. 
um, just because that's the way it should be. And, and you try to explain to them, well, you know, it, it, this is fit for purpose and, and, and this is how we do things, that's how the, the, the company does things. And I'm not just speaking about my current company, I'm speaking about um, other uh, companies as well. So um, other companies that I've worked for, and it's, it's the one or two individuals that feel that, um, yeah, mm -hmm. Sorry, I just wanted to stop there because I'd lost my train no um, of thought. No problems. And just pause for 10 seconds and launch back in when you're ready, okay? Okay. Sorry, it's just a message came up in the bottom of my screen and I was like <laughs> trying to read it. And talk at the same time. <laughs> it was me that sent you. I was just saying, don't hang up at the end and we can have a chat. <laughs> I'll tell All you right, when we okay. stop the call. <laughs> I should have said I can't do two things at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, I need That's to start. Okay. Yeah, I need to start that bit again because I I want to be careful what I say because I don't want to say anything that I I'll get in trouble for. That's fine. I'll ask you the question again and we can launch back into it from there. Okay. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. No problems. It's my fault. I shouldn't have messaged you midway through. <laughs> right. Okay. And three, two, one. So, Carolyn, you mentioned that you've had quite a lot of challenges in your career. What's been your kind of biggest health and safety challenges so far? I think for me, um, and this is my own personal opinion of my own challenges, is having the kind of old school mindset um, on health and safety and how different companies do things slightly differently, but we all do things uh, very similar. And you know, I've 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 done my own uh, homework with with uh, some old team members and new team members with regards to say risk assessments, um, and you have a look at risk assessments, and they all look similar. Um, they all provide similar information, but maybe done in slightly different ways. And I think you know the biggest challenge is having different um, people. Um, and not necessarily when I say clients look at it, it's individuals within that that the work within the companies that see something different and they go to another subcontractor and they see something different, they're not happy and they 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 want it the same way. And it's very difficult to get um different subcontractors to have the same look and feel of, say, a risk assessment, for example. So I think that the biggest challenge is when you're in, in these kind of meetings and you're trying to explain. And there's no change in that mindset. And no matter, I don't think any type of personality you have or how, 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 how hard you have studied um, or how many years experience you've had offshore, you know, once you have that mindset, sometimes it's very, very difficult to change. Um, you know, another um, issue that I've not an issue, um, challenge that I've had is, is being a female in, in the industry. And I don't want to sound cliche about it, but it, it, it's inevitable. And I think my example of, you know, going on mm -hmm. to a hotel, I was literally the only female um, within mm -hmm. 300 people, but I need to really stress that it's very few and far between. These are small challenges that were easily overcome. Um, but yeah, I think it's, it's difficult as a health and safety professional, and I think as well as those of us who work in the office with maybe not as much operational experience, um, mm -hmm. is to go offshore and, and get the guys to understand why I sit in an office and do what I do. You know, I don't mm -hmm. do it just for the sake of it. My team doesn't do it for the sake of it. They do it, you know, to make sure that the guys do come home safe um, and alive for their families. Um, and, you know, that's that's why I do what I do, because I really enjoy it. And I want to make sure that that's that these guys do get home safe. So, you know, it's when you send these these documents offshore or you go and visit um, some of the guys and and, and it, yeah, it's it's difficult to get your your authenticity across to them. To say, no, I'm genuinely here to, to help you. Mm -hmm. Um, and that that's that's a challenge is is to change that mindset from them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you, Carolyn. So if we move forward a little bit, what's coming in the future then? You've obviously had quite a lot of surgery and your health issues. 
you'll be going back to work at some point, I would imagine, progressing yeah. on in your career. Yeah, so I think um, from my perspective, it's all about um, learning more about me and myself, and that's where I've been able to um, to be able to sit back and, and realize that for the past 10 months. Um, what I have found is that my pace of life prior to my diagnosis was so fast. Mm -hmm. um, my son is now all of a sudden 10 and I didn't give him the time that I should have done. Um, but I'm lucky enough that I can rectify that now. Mm -hmm. So I'd made some um, statements at the beginning of this interview that, you know, I wasn't the mum that dropped my son off at school and I wasn't the mum that picked him up. But I am going to be that mum. And yeah, I will work full time as well. But my time needs to be split between mum and, and uh, Carolyn Pierpont, CQ manager. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, obviously, there's going to be some times that it's not going to be, it's going to be a bit difficult, but I need to juggle that and I need to manage it effectively now because I wasn't doing it before. Everything came before my child and also everything came before my health. Mm -hmm. um, I was very much, a, yeah, yeah, I'll go to the doctors tomorrow or yeah, yeah, I'll go to the doctors now. Had I still had that um, attitude of, yeah, I'll do it later, then I doubt I would have gone um, to, the, to the hospital to get this lump checked out mm -hmm. sooner. Um, had I not been bullied by some of the mums in the playground, I definitely wouldn't have gone as early as what I did. So for me, the future holds that um, health, family um, and work will be balanced efficiently and effectively as well. Um, Finding me and understanding me and being a better person of me um, is where I'm going to go and also just continue to be the cheeky manager that I am for, for Bustalis. Mm -hmm. So that's it. That's it in a nutshell. I, you know, I have no um, views of grandeur to take over uh, the world or anything. You know, I'm, I'm happy and, and grateful and thankful for what I've got, you know. If anything, I'd, I'd really like to get down. What's that? Sorry, keep going. No, I said, uh, if anything, I'm going to um, start looking more into the whole mindfulness and um, mindfulness coaching. Uh, I've, I've really enjoyed studying that, actually, um, mm -hmm. since I've been off. So, um, but that's that's it. There's no other thrills and thrills there. It's just uh, just continue to be a good person. Yeah, that's one of the most poignant of the progress in the future questions that I've ever asked, one of the most poignant answers I've ever had back. So thank you for that, Carolyn. Um, if we move on well, now, it probably brings us nicely on to what advice or guidance would you give to someone starting out in health and safety today? I thought about this and it's quite it's a difficult one, but just to stick at it, to be honest with you, it's cha it's challenging. I, you know, there's no two doubts about it. Um, health and safety or HSC uh, is a challenging career not to be taken lightly. Um, the amount of times that I've been told by somebody, oh, I'm away to do my knee wash and I'm going to become a CQ advisor. Okay. It's just a little bit more than your knee wash. Um, and, I, I, and I say that kind of loosely, um, but, you know, it's it's good to have your knee wash. I didn't have my knee wash starting out. I started out just working at the grassroots and, and working my way up and then eventually doing it. Um, but it's, it's challenging. It really is. Um, what advice I'd give is, yeah, just stick to it. If that's where your heart is, go for it. You know, we really need um, proactive agency people that are going to get out there and talk and, and mentor and coach um, people on, on why we want to keep people safe. And, and, and I think that's the key thing with health and safety is, um, you know, people understanding the why, why, why we're doing this, you know, not just, and I, I know I said, you know, to get you home safely, we're doing it, you know, because we're really passionate about it. So, if I've got any advice for anyone yeah. kicking off in health and safety, you know, stick at it. It's a great career, I, I must admit. I, and, you know, to, to finish off, um, one of my, 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 my boss, my old boss, and he's now my mentor now, um, had said to me, Carolyn, he says, we need to make health and safety sexy. I'm like, oh, okay. 
how are we going to do that? He says, I don't know, you figure it out. So, so there you go. Peace advice. Let's make health and safety <laughs> sexy. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> Thank you very much on behalf of the viewers and listeners of the Safer Than Your Average podcast, Cameron. I really appreciate you coming on and sharing your story. It's been absolutely fantastic to have you on the show. Thank you. Thank you so much for inviting me and having me. See, it was worth writing that no article problem. when life goes tits up. So. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely, and if you've not seen the article, check it out on Karen's LinkedIn. I'll put a link <laughs> in the description. Thank you. Thanks, Karen. This podcast is sponsored by Inside Out Group, the specialists in high risk and challenging filming and time lapse, covering health and safety videos for rail, construction, and infrastructure projects nationwide. <laughs>